By the spring of 1970, Hickel was too. He thought the president was wrong to send troops into Cambodia. Attacks are being launched this week to clean out major enemy sanctuaries on the Cambodian-Vietnam border. And Hickel opposed the verbal attacks on student protesters being made by the vice president. Overprivileged, underdisciplined, irresponsible children of the well-to-do blasé permissiveness. Days after that Agnew speech, the National Guard shot and killed the four students at Kent State. When Kent State happened, that was the end of the road. Our own National Guard shot our own students. Hickel the father of six, the cabinet officer who reached out to students, decided he had to talk to President Nixon, convince him to listen to young America. I called the White House to see the president. I was the one person that could talk to him. The president wasn't available. I'm not sure he really wanted to see me. I said, give me John Ehrlichman. And lo and behold, John Ehrlichman wasn't available. I said, what? the hell do I, you, that you were, do I have to do? Do I have to call a press conference to, to get the message out? And so I sat down, I said, I'm gonna write a letter to the president. Walter did not sit down at his desk and pen the letter in longhand. That's not the way it worked. It was a committee effort. Drafts were written, drafts were looked at, drafts were circulated. When the message was finally polished in his heart, it became his message. The letter urged more dialogue with the young, criticized the Agnew speeches, and suggested Nixon meet personally with college presidents and the members of his cabinet. And he just picked his brown pin up and he signed Wally, faithfully Wally. And he said, take that over to the White House. But before it got to the president, the letter was published on page one of the Washington Star. I do not know how the letter found its way into the uh, newspaper. I do not to this very day know how the letter got to the Star. I never asked them because I didn't, I didn't want to put them on the spot or to lie to me. I'll just say I think it was a great letter. I'm glad he wrote it. I'm glad the public got access to it. I think it turned America around at a time we needed to turn. That's all I'll say. I've been denying this thing for 40 years, that it was a public letter. It was a public message. That's why it was written. If you want to call it a leak, we call it a leak. It was a leak. It was a deliberate plan. I had a private meeting just with the secretary and me, and he said, leak the letter. See that the letter reaches some key people in the media. I leaked it to uh, Kenworthy at the New York Times, Spencer Rich at the Washington Post, and the person who broke the story, Bobby Hornig, from the Washington Star. Phone rang, and one of the inner staff said, you better get over here. And I said, why? And he said, well, he said, the secretary's written a hell of a letter. And I said, written a letter to whom? And he said, to Nixon. And I said, I'll be right there. My memory is she looked at it, and she said, Holy shit. It was a personal letter to the President of the United States. One, a cabinet secretary particularly, would not expect the President to have to read the letter in a newspaper. <laughs> Mr. Hickel, did you leak the letter to the press yourself? Absolutely not. I did not leak that letter to the press. I do not know who leaked that letter. No member of your staff? Not that I know of. 
There's no doubt in my mind that Wally Hickel knew the letters were being leaked. In fact, ordered the letters to be leaked. If Wally Hickel were deeply upset that this private communication of the president had been leaked, he would have manifested public outrage first, and secondly, he would have run down the leaker and fired him. And neither of those things occurred, which leads me to conclude that the letter Wally Hickel wrote was written to be published. So you got to understand uh, the cold anger of the President of the United States uh, at coming upon this. Yes, sir. Mr. Bailey. Sir, without asking you to uh, censor the Secretary of the Interior, could you comment on the substantive points that he made in his letter? I think the Secretary of the Interior is uh, a man who has very strong views. He's, uh, he's outspoken, he's courageous. That's one of the reasons I select him for the cabinet. Now, uh, as far as his views are concerned, I will, of course, be interested in his advice. Uh, I might say, too, that uh, I hope he gives some advice to the Postmaster General. That was the fastest mail delivery I've had since I've been in the White House. <laughs> The timing of the letter, the manner in which it was leaked, the way he handled it wasn't the best. But did Hickel have something? Did he get something? And the answer is yes. He got at the essential problem, which was that the country was moving in one direction and the Nixon administration was moving in another. That night, after his press conference, the president had trouble sleeping. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. I got a call from the White House switchboard saying to come down to the White House. Come down now. I got in the staff car, and there were one or two other young people there with me. The president didn't normally take his young staff wandering around with him in, the, in a motorcade. That was very unusual. And we went to the Lincoln Memorial. The president got out of the car, went up the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, and saw these kids who were absolutely dumbfounded that the President of the United States was standing there. The President was coming out because he was trying to relate. He was trying to find some common ground to talk to these kids. The President obviously did listen to Wally Hickel. That letter had an impact. Nixon talked with some of the students. He later dictated a memo describing their conversations. My goals in Vietnam were the same as theirs, to stop the killing and end the war, to bring peace. So they, they did not respond. They, I hoped that their hatred of the war, which I could well understand, would not uh, turn into a bitter hatred of, of, of our whole system, our country and everything that it stood for. Have you heard from the president since you wrote him the letter? No, Mike, I haven't. I'm sure you got a reaction from the White House from a staff member. <laughs> I think that's the understatement of the year. What about you, Jack? Were you proud of the letter? Oh, very much so. I was thinking, do I dare say what I really believe? Do I dare say it on national TV, which could have a negative impact on my dad? Do you and your dad talk about Vietnam? <clears throat> Uh, not Vietnam so much, but more, uh, we discussed the Cambodia situation. I was against the sending of troops. What about him? Uh, I think he was probably against it, too. I just knew that, that that's what Dad would expect me to say. That's what he believed. I was standing up for him, standing up for what he, what he felt. At the White House, the president decided not to fire Hickel right away. You don't make somebody a martyr and a hero to a lot of people, but you just leave him where he is. Let's not do anything now. Let's wait until this gets behind us. And then, goodbye, Wally. Wally Hickel's so different from Richard Nixon. We are probably not being fair to Wally Hickel if we're looking for strategy here. 
I think maybe we should look at it as the product of emotion, heart, concern, and just not knowing what to do. From May through November 1970, Hickle stayed on the job. I mean, it was incredible. He just wouldn't leave. I know nothing about the rumors that were supposed to be in the morning's paper this morning. I think those reports are just about as ridiculous as being fired or quitting. <laughs> You'd find it rather ridiculous to do either? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I have no intention of resigning, uh, and uh, I'm just going to keep on going like a bingo. Okay. Then, just before Thanksgiving, he agreed to another interview with Mike Wallace. Mr. Secretary, surely the president has the perfect right to get himself a new secretary of the interior if he wants one. Yes, uh, uh, he has that perfect right. And I have that feeling that I have been trying to do the job for him and for all the American people. And so I'll say that I'm going to do the best I can. But if I go away, I'm going away with an arrow in my heart and not a bullet in my back. The day after that broadcast, Hickel was summoned to the Oval Office. Well, the president uh, personally terminated me about two hours ago, and there's really nothing that I can say at this time that would help the situation, and uh, nothing I would say to hurt it. But given the hostility toward me when I first arrived, as you people know so well, and some of those incredible decisions that I had to make immediately thereafter, and trying to, to do a job for the president and all Americans, and still somehow survive as an individual, I had to do it my way. Thank you, gentlemen. Would he do the same thing now, knowing he was going to be fired? Absolutely, he would have written that letter. Did he ever regret losing the job? I'm sure he did because he enjoyed part of it and he did good things and he had the potential to do more good things. He didn't regret his actions. He regretted that the president blew it in his mind. He had just come back from the White House and he sat down at his desk and he said, is there anything I need to do? And I said, well, Mr. Secretary, the only thing I would ask you to do, would you autograph a photograph to me from you? I gave him the photo and he wrote across it. He said, to Dave Parker, is it right? Then do it. <laughs> 